We're back. Thank you for joining me. I am your host, Alex Coons of Pie to Pie, and that's what you're tuning into. Today on the podcast, we're talking to Ben Hosher of Gorilla Pies. Gorilla Pies ain't no stranger to the game. You can find them on best of lists, or you might turn on your TV and see them on the news, just like I did. Ben may or may not be a Russian spy. The verdict is still out on that. He did spend two years in Moscow as executive chef of Nobu. We do get an incredible story of Ben's journey through fine dining to becoming a COVID baby, which I think we got to start calling start calling these concepts that came to life during the pandemic of 2020. Masks off. Ben started cooking pizzas in his home kitchen in 2020. Two years later, he's sitting in a brick and mortar. We're going to fill in those gaps, and that's why this episode is so great. I loved every minute of it. It was fantastic. I start feeling like Trump sometimes. (laughs) I loved hearing Ben's story. I loved hanging out at his shop with him. We had a really great conversation. People of the internet, Ben Hosher of Gorilla Pies, Beastie Boys Forever. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here in Valley Village. I got Ben from Gorilla Pies. Awesome. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for your time. Excited to be here as well. The place is is amazing. Very sick. Thank you. Thank you. The deal is 15 questions. Answer them up. There will probably be more that we'll piggyback off of. All right. You ready to go? Let's do it. All right. So I like to usually start off with this question. What attracted you to pizza and who ultimately taught you how to make it? Um, what attracted me to pizza in, in the current form as, as gorilla pies is kind of after being through a number of fine dining kitchens and kind of seeing what, what fine dining is and kind of learning my, learning my craft as a cook and then a chef, um, I always wanted to do my own thing, but I think the, the hardest thing to come to as a creative person um, is what your voice is and what you stand for and what you're going to kind of attach your name to when it comes to how you express yourself through food. In this case, it was hard. You know, I'm 43 years old. I've all, I've had infatuations with many different cultures, cuisines and different things. Um, My first love was Asian food. And I really did that for many, many years. But when it came to opening up my own thing and putting my stamp on the food world as it is, pizza, pizza spoke to me in a, in a different way. Um, I, I look at the crust as kind of uh, the guardrails to my creativity and my ideas because coming up with ideas for tasty things is not the hard part. It's figuring out where you're going to stop and where you're going to focus. And I have trouble focusing. Um, I've got a lot of crazy ideas. And the, the circle, the circle of that crust, whatever happens inside of that crust is what I'm focusing on now. And there was a certain amount of the limitation uh, of that uh, gave me a sense of peace and focus in what I'm doing with food. So would you say that you're self-taught? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my only formal pizza training was uh, at 16. It was, I think, my third job in the industry. Started washing dishes when I was 15 and a half. And then I did a quick stint at Boston Market. Hell yeah. As a teenager, as like my first job, like touching food. And then after that, um, I got a job at a gastro pub that was opening up with wood fired pizza. And that was my first real job on a station, on the line with a chef telling you what it is, getting training and really the, what I know of a professional kitchen. That was my first real line job was wood fired pizzas. Okay. Yeah. Is, does that have a, a little reason to why you you use that oven today? Um, I would call that, you know, it's, it's, it's more coincidence than anything. Um, you know, as, as life goes, you know, I'm in this pizzeria because of timing, uh, 
kismet, if you will. You know, it was going out of business. I was looking for a shop. It was close to where I lived. It's a perfect box for kind of a first first attempt. And um, dumb luck, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get back to that. Uh, the dumb luck and this spot. Oh. You got to answer that? No. All right. Business. Owner. Hey, you never know. It's, it's an eight. As an owner. owner. Sorry. Bus- when business put calls. put your phone on silent there, oh, chef. Oh. <laughs> uh, just for everyone listening and not watching, Ben looks like he's about 28. So I don't know what the skin <laughs> recommend uh, regimen is, but uh, maybe you can share that with me after the podcast. Well, it's. You're looking it, good, my boy. It, it's, it's, it's deceiving because I have the face of a 28 year old, but the joints of a 60 year old. Okay. So, you know, um, I I have crazy arthritis. I have a I have a fused ankle. I have a fake hip. Um, so, yeah, so Robocop over here. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, is that a lot to do with uh, your time spent in the kitchen, or was this from other things? It's not unrelated, but you know, in my youth, I was I played basketball up through freshman year of college. You know, I walked on to a Division three NCAA team and played one played one year, and then everything kind of started going downhill from there joint wise. Um, so I, you know, stopped, you know, competitive athletics and then I got into martial arts and I studied judo for a while, uh, dabbled around with some other arts for a while, which is not, not kind to the joints. Yeah. And then got into professional cooking, being on my feet, you know, from anywhere from 40 to 70 hours a week, you know, at, at its peak and that's it's a grind yeah it's an that's, absolute grind that's just a recipe for some damage yeah for also sure. if you're not watching and we're also sitting down ben's actually nine feet tall <laughs> uh okay so you've you've been in like fine dining prior to your pizza career here yes. um i i find it interesting what is it about pizza that attracts people like yourself uh like it, with high caliber culinary skills um to an art that at its core is fairly simple and easy well, um, it's it's interesting because the the my formal training really was with the Nobu Restaurant Group, um, and Japanese food at its core is very similar to Italian food if you think about it. Um, you know the Japanese ideal of finding the highest quality ingredients, um, manipulating them minimally and presenting them at their height and beauty is kind of like the core philosophy. And if you think about Italian cuisine, um, it's extremely similar. You know, I think it's a little bit maybe diluted in the, through like the American guys, but, you know, finding the best quality tomatoes, the best flour, the best cheese, you know, you're just, fo- you're, you, you have an ingredient focus you have an amazing oven. You're cooking it properly, and you're and you're presenting it. It's there's a simplicity to it that um, that I find uh, comforting and also freeing because you know at its at its core, tomato cheese dough is pizza, um, and it can be as plain and mundane or absolutely as fancy as you want to go. You know, I always think about, you know, Wolfgang Puck and, you know, and coming up with a smoked salmon pizza Mm -hmm. at Spago. You can, I, I, I love thinking about that example because when I do want to come out of my fine dining bag, you know, guys like him kind of laid the path for doing super fancy pizza. And then there's whole other more traditional schools of keeping things completely plain and like the Neapolitan strict rules of what a Neapolitan pizza is. That's kind of a whole different side of thinking, but it's all pizza at the end of the day. Um, And I love that it can really transcend from the lowest to the highest and it can really operate at any level. Yeah. I love the flexibility of that. Most definitely. So coming back to the dumb luck and the, the origin story, you lost your job in 2020, right? At Nobu or were you working somewhere else? No, I was um, I was at Mama Shelter Hotel in okay. Hollywood. Um, we shut down briefly when COVID started. 
and reopen the rooftop in Hollywood as soon as dining was allowed again. And we we were crushing it, honestly. I mean, you know, it was one of the one of the few kind of fun rooftop places to go get a drink and a burger in Hollywood in the middle of a pandemic when people were all trapped in their houses. Um, you know, it was definitely a hot spot. It was not the funnest environment to, to be working in with all of, you know, with trying to institute, you know, all the masking and the social distancing with people that are drunk and just want to have a good time and don't necessarily want to hear what you're talking about. So that was, uh, that was an interesting, interesting experience going through that. Um, long story short, we did over a million dollars in food and beverage in the midst of a pandemic. And then I got fired on Thanksgiving. Oh, yes. Darkness. <laughs> yeah. Damn, dude. On, on the exact day of Thanksgiving. I mean, it was the it Some was like the, the last day that anybody would be working before everybody yeah. goes away for break. OK. Um, but it honestly, you know, I talk about it with, you know, a little a little bit of a chip on my shoulder sometimes. But in, in, on, in all honesty, is the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, because <clears throat> if that hadn't happened, gorilla pies wouldn't exist. Um, you know, when you have the kind of rug pulled out from under you, when you feel like you're doing everything that you've been asked to do in a tough situation, um, and then it's taken away, it sucks. Yeah. You know, nobody, it, it's never fun to be fired. You know, I've been on both sides of the table and it's just, it's not, it's just not good no matter what, no matter how you feel about it, you know, you know, if you understand that the company's not doing well and you're not taking it personally, this, that, and the next one, you're still out of a job mm -hmm. and you still lose that purpose of where you're going every day. And just the, the sense of, you know, worth, you yeah. know, of having a job, but you know, it was, you know, I've been through a couple different career transitions in my life. Um, when I got out of college, I, I owned an art magazine and I did that for six or seven years, um, with, with relative success. And then in 2008, when the economy kind of crumbled and everything was, everything was uncertain with all the subprime thing and this and that and the next one. And we had started a, a physical magazine, like before social media was, was what it is now. And it just, it was time to move on to the next thing. And at 28, I hit the reset button and figured out what I really wanted to do as an adult. Cause the publishing thing kind of happened when I was young and I kind of fell into it and just rolled with it. And, and at 28, I sat down you know, and really contemplate what I wanted to do with my life. And it was food, you know, after, after meditating on it and really thinking, I just set my mind about to get a job in food because it's what I love to do. I've been doing it for as long as I can remember. And it was something that I felt like I was just relatively talented at. It was something that came, came naturally to me and I loved doing. So I just decided to focus on that as a career. Yeah. Um, which led me to getting a job as the back of the house. Well, the, I was the receiver. I was hired as the receiver at Nobu LA and then got promoted to be back of the house manager pretty quickly, but literally started from the bottom. You know, the guy just here. check checking in the orders in the morning. Yeah. But I was happy to get a job at a, at a good company and knew that I was going to learn a ton and just, kind of went, went at it with everything that I knew how to do. And three years later, I was executive chef in Moscow, Russia. In Moscow, Russia? Yeah, I got transferred after working my ass off for, for three years, got the opportunity to move to Moscow, Russia and be the executive chef for Nobu there. How long were you in Russia for? Two years. How was Russia? Was that lit? It was... It was wild. I mean, the 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 expat chef lifestyle is is nice. Yeah. Um, pretty much everything is taken care of for you. You got somebody that's going to drive you around. Um, you get you make good money, you know, within <coughs> excuse me, within a couple weeks, you're on all the newspapers. It's like, oh, new international chef for the, the famous Nobu this and that and the next one. So it was. 
it was relatively glamorous. It was it was fun. Um, so, what brought you back to the states? Um, at the end of the day, career wise, um, you can make good money when you're in Russia, but nobody cares what you do when you're in Russia. It just you know it's it's on a piece of paper, and somebody says, "Oh, you had a job there, cool," but after being there for a year and kind of facing the the Russian culture of like people in Russia tend to want to become managers so that they don't have to work anymore. The ideal is like, I'm a manager. Now I tell everybody else what to do and I don't have to work that well, hard. In a lot of ways, That's, it's like that in America too. Sure. But as a chef, you know, I didn't come up in, with that idea yeah. and I – wanted to be there and I wanted to make sure that it was excellent. And after two years, my honest fear was that I was going to lose my edge and never be able to come back to America because I would be kind of lulled into the comfort of like, you're making a good salary. You don't have to work that much, you know, just kind of sit back and do your thing. And yeah. I saw other expats that had gone there, met a Russian woman, had a child and, kind of the life they were leaving and leading and that that wasn't for me. Yeah, so you got so, the fuck out of there. Yeah. I had to get back to the grind. Okay. And you came back here. I I moved from Moscow to New York. Okay. Um took a big pay cut, you know, at the time when you're working in a big uh corporate entity like like Nobu and you're at the executive chef level, you don't get to just go wherever you want and continue to be an executive chef. There's yeah. only so many restaurants, so many positions available. So it's either you stay in a position that you have or you move to a different location, but then um, you take the position that's open. So yeah. there was a sous chef position. So I came back to the U.S. to a huge pay cut, um, paying taxes and doing like four times as much work. You know, the difference between working in New York and working in Moscow is couldn't be more different. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, we got to find out how you got to L.A. So then from there, did you transfer? So from so I, I busted my ass in New York for about a year and a half or so as sous chef bouncing between at the time there was Nobu downtown and Nobu next door which was Nobu downtown was the first ever Nobu. And then Nobu next door was opened up to just to facilitate how much demand there was. So that was kind of the sister restaurant. And then Nobu 57 is the behemoth up in Midtown. So I was primarily downtown, but then I was also bouncing up to 57 and doing shifts as a sous chef there and just kind of going wherever I was needed and doing my best. But, um, you know, after feeling the pain of the pay cut and the taxes and the hours that, that I was required to work on salary, which was uh, not a good salary to, to be working in New York as a sous chef. Yeah. I just decided that it was my time to do something else. Yeah. You know, I like to say that I cooked one too many pieces of black cod uh -huh. and decided it was time for me to go. Yeah. So, you know, I went through the process of, uh, you know, looking around the city and trying to find something that I could sink my teeth into as like a next logical step. Shout out to Crystal Arabian at uh, Kitchen Kitchen Culture Recruiting, I believe the company is now. Um, she connected me with Janoon, uh, which was at the time was a one Michelin star Indian restaurant that was looking for a chef de cuisine modern, which was basically taking traditional flavors and working in 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 concert with another chef de cuisine traditional who would, you know, understand the flavors. And then it was my job to refine the food and create uh, a Michelin level tasting menu to represent what the restaurant was. So um, I did that for about six months, um, found out the hard way that the Indian work week is six days without much you know they just expected you to be there for six days so 70 to 80 hours a week it was it was brutal but i learned absolute like unbelievable amounts of knowledge that i took in in six months because i was making you know three chutneys and three pickles for a michelin star restaurant every day for six months yeah 
So got really good at making chutneys. I bet. Uh, pickles is something that I've always kind of gotten into. But once I lo- kind of figured out the framework of creating amazing chutneys, uh, that was just it's just so much fun. I love making sauces and creating flavors is one of my favorite things to do in food. So doing that was just uh, incredibly beneficial. And it really opened up my understanding of spices in general. Yeah. Yeah. Well, looking at your menu, I, just from the work that you've done, you can see that a lot of your work prior has definitely inspired your menu, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I really, when I first started doing pizza, I felt very strongly that I wasn't going to start doing pizza that was just, you know, translations of other food that I had made in my life. Like I wasn't going to start and just do a bunch of Japanese pizzas and a bunch of Indian pizzas and just other flavors that I knew. I really set about to kind of stay as far away from Asian food and what I had done in the past as possible. But, you know, you can only escape your own training and what you like to cook for so long. So, yeah. you know, little things like uh, frying shiitake mushrooms, something that I learned about at Nobu and worked on for many, many years. So when I was creating the our Green Monster pizza, I was trying to create something that was like a very umami forward flavor bomb, but vegetable, but vegetables and crispy shiitake is just I had always when you when you cut it right and you cook it right and you salt it properly it it really gives you a bacony kind of vibe 100%. so i decided that i wanted to include that on one of my signature pizzas because i would much rather just treat a vegetable with the proper technique than use a plant-based bacon as an example yeah well done i think that the it's more beneficial that way because a lot of that plant-based stuff is kind of trash anyways. Yeah. I mean, it's question. The actual health of it is pretty questionable. A hundred percent. Um, the other, the other thing that I, that I point to as kind of like a shout out to my past is, uh, I make, uh, char siu Chinese barbecue pork from scratch for my Hawaiian pizza. Um, because you know, Canadian bacon has no place on a Hawaiian pizza. That's, you know, how that ever came to be, I don't know. Well, I think it was actually like a Canadian dude in the in the 80s who coined it. You know, that it very well might be. Um, but having been to Hawaii and experiencing the culture and having such a deep love for Asian food, um, char siu makes total sense. Yeah. Because that's something that's consumed – in Hawaii regularly, it's part of the culture. So just taking my history and my background and my love, I started making char siu for staff meal at Nobu. Yeah. And, you know, over, you know, probably 15 years ago, started just playing around with that flavor profile. And, you know, when you're making staff food in a, in a big corporate restaurant, pork butt's pretty cheap yeah and you can kind of do it at will and it's it's pretty inexpensive to throw together but i developed a love for it and really kind of you know when there's something that i eat that i enjoy i'm like a dog with a bone trying to figure out how i can recreate it and that was kind of like the beginning of of cooking for me in general was like going to a chinese restaurant and eating a dish that I liked and then going home and experimenting and trying to try to figure out how they got that flavor. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the origin of me tinkering in the kitchen and which kind of like grew into more of an obsession with food. It's kind of interesting too. Cause I, I've looked at your menu, you know, I've looked at pictures. I haven't had your food, but to, to listen to the brief story that you've given me and it's, it's, so much of your journey is is probably on that menu. Yeah, you know what I a mean. Lot, a lot like, of it. Uh, which is like, I don't think a lot of people can say that. It's like you. A lot of times people do traditional pizzas that they think they should have on their menu. I think we all do it. Yep. You know, everyone wants to do a hot pepperoni with Mike's hot honey and whatever. Not saying it's bad, but it's like you have taken classics, I think, and like really made them your own. Thank you so much. You know what I mean. Appreciate that. And it just listening to you you can you can tell how much time and effort went into that menu 
Thank so, you. Yeah. I don't know where I was going with that. I just wanted, I just, it was an observation. Hey, I, I appreciate that very much. And it's oh, funny. Shit. It's funny that you bring up uh, hot honey as just an example of, I guess my approach, um, you know, being this, being the son of uh, two artists, you know, my father specifically taught me the term contrarian when I was young. And I have taken that, taken that to heart when I approach being creative because I don't have hot honey here. Um, I could, but when I, when I see, when I see what I, what it feels like, Oh, everybody's got hot honey on their pepperoni pizza. To me, I don't want to mess with it. I don't, I don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Like when I see something that's trendy, uh, my instinct is to go opposite because if you're just doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, how do you differentiate yourself? No, I, I, I agree. The minute too many people find out about my favorite band, fuck that CD. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but but then again, the the true reality of owning a retail food establishment is you also got to give the people what they want. Yeah. So you know, I I it's it's a constant struggle that I have, and you know, I got to give props to my team who who challenge that and push against that. Um, Matt, who is my sous chef and my right hand man and kind of partner in crime in this, you know, has has definitely gently over time pushed me towards things that when I first opened this place, I would never do. Um, you know, when I first opened up the idea of selling French fries as a pizzeria, I was like, why? Why do I need French fries? I'm not a burger joint. You know, yeah. I, I, it's just not something that necessarily made sense to me. Although people would come in and ask me for French fries, not infrequently. But, you know, a little further down as we got into things, um, <clears throat> the idea of doing loaded fries with the same combinations of some of our most popular signatures, um, but just on a pile of French fries, over time and a little bit of prodding, it really made sense got a great reaction and now we do it. So I definitely come around and I, I, I feel very strongly that having a buy-in from your team and having the people that are, have their hands on the pulse and are creating all of the food on a daily basis. If their heart's not in it, your food will suffer. So when I'm going to, when I decide to go in a direction, I, I really, really try hard to get a, a committee decision for the people that are here, the key players that are helping this thing be what it is. I want everybody to be on board and be pumped mm -hmm. and be excited about it. Because when people are passionate, pumped and excited about the food that they're making, it's just going to taste better. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, always riding that balance between what people want and what you actually want to give them. Right. How did, did the pizza thing start out as a fun thing? Yeah, did you absolutely. Have a, did you, were you already cooking it? Did you have an oven steel? Were you cooking on a brick? Like how? Did, yeah. So, so the, the, I kind of restarted tinkering with it when I, I was in the Caribbean, I was cooking in the Caribbean and I had been nursing a totally destroyed ankle for over a year. I had gone through, you know, getting the job at the Michelin star restaurant, knowing that I needed surgery. They weren't going to wait for a three month on crutches and then another six months of physical ther therapy for me to then start. So I just said, fuck it. Great. We'll start. And then uh, my buddy Miles called me and said, hey, you know, come out to St. Kitts, come out to the Caribbean and cook with me. And it was a great opportunity. And he's he's my brother. And I always wanted a good opportunity to cook with him. So they didn't have any time to wait. So I said, fuck it. And I just went on to the next job. But when I got out to St. Kitts, you know, everything, everything was cool. But then everything became not cool very quick. Uh, Miles had to, Miles got out of there and it was kind of my opportunity to hit the pause button, take a break, take care of my body and kind of reset. So 
at, you know, 30 something, I moved back in with my parents to get this surgery and <clears throat> recover because I had to be non weight bearing for three months. So I was on crutches for three months and then I had to learn how to walk again. And, um, they took me in and took care of me as I, as I recovered, but we had always had a tradition of <clears throat> pizza, family pizza night on Sunday. And my dad would just make it for my mom. But then when I came, came to town, I said, pops, Take a break, bud. I got this. <laughs> Let the Novu master in. Yeah, so I was, you know, I just kind of took on the responsibility of cooking pizza for me and my parents when I was recovering and basically had nothing else to do. So I, I started there just making one to two dough balls every week, you know, and I'd make, you know, one week I'd have some success. The next week I'd have a failure, but... um doing doing a little bit every week kind of i got into it and it started being a ritual and a routine um w once i was able to walk again and i was looking to get get back into work um i moved i moved back to la and moved into the same neighborhood where my brother jake was living um and then we started kind of uh i would make pizza and then invite him over and that was fun um and we kind of did that informally. Um, and then when the shit hit the fan, if you will, and I lost my job, um, it was kind of a kind of a knee jerk reaction. You know, I lost my job and my internal response was, fuck it, I'm making pizza. You know, there was just no there was no no time to think. There was no second guessing. There was no woe is me. There was just like, fuck it, I'm making pizza. I, I don't know where it came from. It was just uh, just a, an inspiration that kind of came to me. Mm -hmm. And when I thought through it a little bit more, it's like, okay, society's crumbling. Nobody knows what's up or down. We don't know when anything's going to get back to normal. You know, businesses are in disarray. There's no supply chain. And honestly, it was kind of a bit of an opening where – you know, I'm a pretty compliant guy and I'm not super comfortable kind of uh, doing things that are quasi legal, especially when it comes to food and the health department and things like that. So I wouldn't you know, I was very prior to that experience. I was very hesitant and nervous about doing something out of my apartment because you're not supposed to do it. Yeah. Um, but just the environment for of the pandemic just kind of made me feel like, like, what do you got to lose? Like, what's the worst that's going to happen? Yeah, it's wild, wild west. Um, yeah. So I said, fuck it. Just started doing it. And so you started selling pizzas out of your apartment. Yeah. And you were mostly using Instagram to sell them? No. Brick and mortar. I had a laser jet printer. I printed up I printed up a menu. And I, going back to my, like, old school magazine days, I printed out menus. And I put them, I just put them on people's houses like two to three block radius around like and you were, what? were you delivering? No. Okay. People uh, were picking up at your spot. Though. Curbside. Okay. Yeah. But I was like at Woodman and Ventura, um, handed, handed out menus in the neighborhood and, um, received just an unbelievable amount of support from the community, which was kind of centered at uh, Steve's coffee roaster on Ventura Boulevard. Um, shout out to Chevy, who was the manager at the time who just, kind of just did nothing but be an amazing supporter, cheerleader, unofficial PR person. You know, she's just an amazing food service professional herself and was really the heart and soul of the coffee roaster. And people would come in and she would tell people about me. Yeah. And, you know, coffee's local, pizza's local. So people will come get their coffee and find out about me and give me a buzz. And, you know, it wasn't a lot, you know, during, during the pandemic, like if I was doing like 10 to 12 pies in a day, I thought I was killing it. Mm -hmm. I was like, I got something good here. Hell yeah. Um, working out of a G G E still oven with a baking steel. Yeah. That's it. You, you didn't like mod it or do anything weird in the back or anything? Try to burn your house down. Um, 
Oh, the 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 most extreme thing that I did was taking out the bottom rack and putting the steel directly on the floor of yeah. the oven. Because um, what I realized is that, you know, dumb ovens are dumb ovens, and you can set it to five fifty, but if you have a ripping flame that's hitting a piece of metal, which is then touching the other piece of metal, you can get that surface up to like six hundred degrees, and you know, at that at that heat. You can make decent pizza. Yeah, hundred percent. Which is the craziest thing because I've not heard this from from anyone who was doing this. Somebody called the health department on you. Yes. And so, how does that shake down? Did they, did they call you or did they show up at your door? Or they tell you they're so, gonna, they're taking you down. No. So I got. It was all. It all happened via the next door app. Oh my god! So they got you. So I found out about next door, and I was like. Somebody told me about it. That was a really cool app where people talk about cool things in the neighborhood. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm just going to announce that I'm out here doing pizza on Nextdoor. Okay. I did it, which was very positive, um, although Nextdoor didn't appreciate it at all. They're like, oh, you're not supposed to be, you know, advertising a business. And they're like, well, you can buy advertising. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll buy advertising. They're like, well, it's a wait list. You can't advertise. So I'm like, so you don't want me to do this. And then you also don't want me to take take your money. Long story short, people started talking in the neighborhood and people were talking about it. And then somebody, I'm assuming it's somebody that either owned a business and lost their business or was working for a restaurant and that got shut down and they lost their job. Somebody was hate. Yeah. They just said, this is an illegal business. Support legal businesses. This, you know, this shouldn't be happening. So that was, I knew that the, when somebody says that publicly and feels that way, I kind of, in the back of my head, thought, you know, when's the other shoe going to drop? Um, and one day I'm literally like cooking marinara, like just like browning garlic and olive oil in my apartment. Like there's no way they didn't smell it. But apparently there was an inspector that came to the building. Uh, They talked to my downstairs neighbor and thankfully um, I'm a good dude and I'm friends with everybody. And I was also feeding them pizza. So the health department came and my downstairs neighbors kind of played dumb. Then the inspector called my landlord and my landlord basically, you know, was like, you know, told them that they could, they could give him their information, but he wasn't going to give them mine. Yeah. So it, it all, the, I kind of just, kind of just got, got away with it. Um, but I also took that as a sign that it was time to go legit. Yeah. Because, you know, I was, I was playing the game, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Worst that can happen is you get reported to the health department and they come and they shut you down. Yeah. I never actually got shut down. So I just decided it's time to shut down the pop-up. I shut it down on my own and then just decided to go legit. And as luck would have it, this place had come on the market not too long ago. It was, you know, 10 to 15 minutes away from my house. You know, all the bones were here. It was an asset sale. I had everything I needed in a decent oven, a good mixer, a walk-in. And I just said, fuck it. You know, let's, let's do it. So first of all, this space is rad. To me, this is like a quintessential pizza slice shop. If you're just listening, what like 600 square feet in the front here? I'm I'm bad with math. Yeah, I mean it's a th- it's a th- about a thousand in total, and yeah, it's probably about 60 percent minimal in the front. seating, uh, counter service. It's it's perfect. I mean, if you're looking for uh, a restaurant, a pizza shop, this is a dime, right? Yeah. Um, was that it was that that oven was already here yes so was 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 that the oven that you wanted or was that like i can i can work with that and Bro, what kind I of oven is that out of a ge uh, yeah i know oven. i know but like anything that i got was like oh shit this is a real pizza oven yeah it could have been a baker's pride deck oven i'd have been i'd have been fine i'd have figured it out but you know the fact that it was a, an earthstone oven that i could burn wood in if i wanted um, was just an absolute plus, Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I really, 
you know, as you can see by looking at my pizza, I'm a big fan of char. Um, I love, I love leoparding. I love bubbles. I love funky. I love, you know, really artisanal pizza that, that looks a little scary sometimes, honestly. Like I, 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 I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and the nature of this oven is the heat's aggressive. It gets really aggressive. So I'm kind of riding the line. I'm, I'm cooking lower temperatures than what a Neapolitan Neapolitan would be, but definitely much higher than New York would ever go. Um, Is so, space ever an issue in that oven? All the time. Yeah, because you're you're not you don't have multiple decks. It's just yeah. Um, I, I I'm I like this oven, but I'm over it. Yeah. Um, at this stage, the level of uh, demand that we see, um, we have to uh, we have to change our process based on the oven because the recovery time on the floor on busy nights the floor will be ice cold you have yeah. super hot air and the floor like you can't get any color on your undercarriage at all yeah because you're throwing so much you know room temperature slash chili dough on mm -hmm. that floor even if you are moving around you know, when we get hit, we get hit real, real hard, and it happens real, real fast. Yeah, everyone always wants to eat at the exact same time. Always. Yeah, and floor heat is going to be the, the hardest part in any oven, but when you only have, you know, four spots, five spots for pizzas in there, right? Less. Yeah. I mean, three, you can actively manipulate three. You can fit four in, but when you have four in one is kind of towards the end of the cooking process yeah. and, and you're cycling it. But even then it's, it's cumbersome. Yeah. It's hard to control. And then when you're dealing with, you know, 800 plus degrees, a little miscalculation here or there, a little loss of focus here or there, that shit goes down. So you gotta, you know, manage it as best you can. Is, was there, would there be like a, a plan to get a different oven right there? Like what? Oven? I want to replace that oven with three. Three of those? I want no, 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 no. That's not physical. I, uh, moving to a deck. Okay. Um, it, the Pizza Master decks that we got to use at Pizza City Fest. Mm -hmm. um, they've really done a great job in creating a deck oven that can give you the results. Uh, of the high heat and <clears throat> the the leoparding and the the kind of aggressive heat that you want out of a dome oven, but in the form factor of a deck. Yeah. Um, because three decks would increase my my throughput by six x. Yeah, of course. Um, also, I want to be able to have different levels of heat so that I can do square pies every day uh -huh. so that I can facilitate more like calzones and strombolis and other things that are really, really much better in a, in a less aggressive heating environment, something that's thicker and more dense that takes some time to cook through. I love all of that stuff, but with this limited, the limited real estate we have in this oven, you know, we do square pies on Thursdays now. Sometimes we'll do it on Fridays. Um, calzones, you know, I've messed around with, you know, I did a uh, I did a Thanksgiving dinner calzone nice. seasonally where we literally took everything that would be in a Thanksgiving dinner and Threw it in crammed it in a calzone just for fun. But, I mean, that was like a, a one-off thing that we did quick. But... I love calzones. Yeah. Um, and I know other people do too. So it's definitely something that I want to do. It's just not feasible in the current oven situation. So that's really the only restricting thing because to me, this, this is definitely the spot. I think sometimes having more spaces is, is a bad thing, but if you come in here, you can basically see you slapping out pies right here, putting them in. Exactly. Uh, all you need is just a nine thirty three pizza master yeah i i have one and we have a designated just like square the bottoms is just for squares and yep. it is i mean it i can't i can't complain shout out pizza <laughs> master yeah I, lo I love you let's I, get a sponsorship <laughs> the only thing is if you're going to get one of those have you looked into getting one yes do you have enough power yes okay i mean if you have enough power i say pull the trigger shout out to big andre at socal edison who 
actually came in and uh, did the Lord's work and just kind of, you know, traced my circuits and just came in and, and verified that I had enough power and capacity to power the ovens that I want to get. Now I just got to, you know, scrape up the 50 to which, get the which, oven which plus the 933. Yeah, the 933. Yeah. Yeah, the prices went up. I got lucky. Too. I bought mine, I think, two, two or two and a half, three years ago. Yeah. But uh, I didn't know that you needed. You need like 133 amps or That's whatever. That's a lot of power. You almost need 200 amps to. And and really, it's they don't use that much all the time. It's just got it goes capacity. right to yeah, it goes right to temperature in 25 minutes. You know, you're at 625. Well, it takes a Baker Pride two hours. How long does your oven start take to to heat up? I can gain. 100 degrees per hour. Oh, my God. You got to get here at 5 in the morning. Yeah. Turn that thing on. Well, for the first year, I didn't turn the oven off. Oh, really? Just let just it burn? Turn, yeah. No, just turn it down. You turn it down at night so that you still had your baseline 600-ish degrees when you got in. Yeah. Now we turn it off every night. And I, you know, my guy, my, you know, first person in the building, first person in the building is 7 a.m., so, you know, overnight, like if you, if you shut off your oven at like 9, 30, 10 and you're eight plus when you get in at seven, it's in the fours. Okay. So you need, you need four to five hours to get that thing up to temp to be ready. It's like a, all ovens are, are like an interest or like our, like an instrument, you know? Yeah. You got to fine tune those. You got to oh, know how to play yeah. them. They all are different. Yeah. I mean, and even here, like with this oven, I have really interesting air dynamics where like sometimes when the front door is open, it creates a positive or negative air pressure mm -hmm. and the fire will just go out. Damn. That's not fun. No. <laughs> Especially but, in the middle of a rush. Well, you know, but the, the beauty of it is like when you have that amount of brick and stone that's superheated, like fire goes out for a couple minutes sometimes the temperature goes up believe it or not yeah. i still don't understand how that works yeah it's haunted yeah thermodynamics so man. what's the what's the game plan are you getting what are you are you, are you gonna the, get, get, get a loan or what are you, the, out you know a credit the, card? the no i mean the the game plan is where we're are you gonna uh, have to get a hood or change your your Shh, your air. Oh my god! Um, there's a hood there a, now. A little chimney, I think, um, is because it's electric. Is maybe right. all you need. Well, there, that that is what exists now. Is a, is a small hood that that was that was classified for. It's good enough to burn wood, so and it's that should enough. be fine. Um, it's we're we're entering a phase of uh, of entertaining uh, investment. Um, I, you know, I'm still kind of getting the package together and mm -hmm. kind of figuring out exactly what I want to do, but you know, just getting an oven is not like, Oh yeah, now I got a bigger oven. No doubt. Well, well what, are, how about the humans that are going to then make the six times more pizza that you then can make? Yeah. So it's, it's a complicated plan of like, you got to build the infrastructure, then you got to hire up to utilize that infrastructure while while still maintaining the demand that you feel that you have to justify the equipment that you're bringing in. Yeah. So a lot of moving parts. Well, I always say if you buy it, they will come. Yeah. Yeah. Field of dreams. That's. I mean, it's. Uh, I I have, I have. Unbridled optimism and what we can do. Yeah. Um. It doesn't happen fast. Nothing ever does. Um, Not the it good sure things. Sure as hell ain't easy, but you know the way I feel is if you show up every day and do good work and be a good person, things have a way of working themselves. Hundred percent. Are you sole owner? Uh, my my brother is a business partner. Okay. But it's all family money. Okay. And you, but you would look for outside investment. Um, yeah, to a degree. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, do I, am I interested in other people's opinions and inviting in other stuff, uh, within reason? Yeah. Um, I don't know everything about the restaurant business or finance or marketing or strategy. So the optimal person would come to the table with 
uh, you know, if I just needed money, I would go to a bank. Yeah. The way I look at investment is that person that you're going to get in bed with metaphorically needs to be bringing something to the table. Uh, they need to add value on top of money Yeah. because just money, you know, that's what banks are for. Yeah. Charge you an interest rate, you pay them back, you owe them nothing. But if somebody wants a piece of your business, they sure as heck better be coming to the table with something that's going to materially improve what that business is. Are you, and you don't have to answer any of these questions because I'm getting into money stuff. Are you currently in, in debt to anything here? I mean, I'm, we're, we're, I'll say that we're barely breaking even. Okay. Um, so, you know, we, you know, cash flow is real. Business is real. Yeah. Um, but it's, but every, all of the trends are everything, you know, week over week, month over month, year over year, everything's trending positive. Yeah. So, you know, we're two years in, we, we really know what we're doing a shit ton more than we did originally. The team is ready to crank out high quality food at high volume. Right. So we've, we've done the due diligence to get ready for kind of the next phase of the business. Yeah. And we're, we're just ready, ready for it to happen. Yeah. You know, we're, we're in it. We're in the summer season right now. Everything's a bit slower and softer. <clears throat> Looking forward to fall rolling around again. Um, the active plan right now is we're looking at expanding, expanding our hours back to lunchtime because we did we did lunch hours opening at noon uh, for the first year, and it was it was fine, but it wasn't it didn't do the numbers that it needed to do, but you know the amount of kind of critical acclaim and PR and press and things that we've done. You know, in the meantime, you know, social media as well, you know, we just have our visibility is bigger and, you know, seeing and feeling the demand of like, oh, man, I I came here and I wanted to get lunch and you weren't here. Like after you hear that enough times, you know, just doing the kind of grandma research and talking to your customers all the time, it feels like it's time to do lunch again. Um, we're working on rolling out. Uh, basically doubling our, our sandwich uh, offering. Uh, we're, we're, what are your sandwich sales? I, would, I like to ask this question for people that do sandwiches. I love sandwiches, but I think that they're actually very hard to execute. They take a lot of work. Do you know what like the percentage of your sandwich sales are? No, I, like, I don't. It's not high. Yeah. Um, like, it's, so, so, so then is it like a labor of love? Do you love I, I really, really do. Yeah. Um, I thought I wanted to, I wanted to open a sandwich shop before I ever wanted to open a pizzeria. Mm -hmm. um, baking bread was kind of one of the, the first loves that kind of led me into playing with dough. Um, and it took me about a year to figure out what my sandwich bread was, which is our dough, which we, which I take, I take my dough balls and I, and I cut them in half and I set them in a rectangular form and that's our sandwich bread. Love it. Stumbled upon it, stumbled upon that about a year in after, excuse me, a number of failed attempts trying to talk to, you know, commercial bakers and contract things and find somebody that would provide the bread regularly, have it be fresh, yeah. you know, have it be to my standards, what I was trying to do. And then also, you know, have it be somewhat unique because I want to do things different. So I couldn't find anybody that was going to make the bread for me to the level that I wanted. I also didn't know how many sandwiches I was going to sell. So after tinkering a bit, about a year, I just kind of stumbled on it after it was a bad, it was a batch of dough that was a little overproofed. And I just started, I just started messing with it, you know, try to create something that felt like a sandwich, um, took a little bit of tinkering, but we figured it out. And then, you know, immediately we're, you know, meatballs were already on the menu, meatballs and impossible meatballs were already on the menu. So that was, you know, immediately we started doing meatball subs um spicy cold cut very shortly thereafter yeah just using you know we're you using soap we have prosciutto in-house 
you know, I brought Capicola in just to kind of round out the cold cut idea. So we started doing that and we've had limited success, but we also haven't actually put sandwiches on our menu that we hand out to everybody. Yeah. And we haven't spent a t- we've done a little bit of marketing towards it, but going back to lunch, it's really about, you know, we're taking the meatball and the cold cut and adding a turkey club, which is just just a standby sandwich mm-hmm. that, you know, everybody loves, but I'm putting my spin on it. Then we're doing a crispy pepperoni bacon lettuce and tomato sandwich Ooh, okay. which we just came nice. to last a week flare on that yeah so that's good that's that's gonna be super fire um it took a little while for me to even bring traditional pepperoni in the building i really yeah, because it's not even under, you don't have a, like the pepperoni pizza it's a super strong like yeah, yeah yeah well the the evolution of gorilla pies is that the pepperoni pizza is gonna become Oh, sorry. Uh, a pizza that has crispy pepperoni on it, so that it's not confusing to people, so they can get they can get their traditional pepperoni fix, and then the basic Benny, which is my signature, that yeah. is going to be only so prasada. But these are the kind of things that you know, like you need to be in business for a while and evolve, and you know, maybe make you know not the best decision, which is like having two pizzas on the menu, which are very similar, calling them different things, and you know. Some people get it, some people don't. So I'm just trying to simplify a little bit. Yeah, well, that's kind of like the balance you talked about of, of like what you want to do and maybe like what people really want. Because right. like the pepperoni pizza, unfortunately, is usually the best seller at a yep. shop. You yep. know what I mean? And as hard as that is for people like myself and you who are very creative with their food, it, we'd be stupid not to just offer that, yeah. right? Yeah. But sometimes it's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. I mean, it's not a mistake that I named that pizza the Basic Benny. Yeah, and named it after myself, and it's it's basic. Yeah, you know that's that's the the straightforward. It's what it is. Yeah, no, we, I don't, I didn't carry any soda at Hot Tongue for the first year. And okay. So like, I I don't drink it, so I didn't want to have like a Coke, Diet Coke. I just didn't want it. I was like, if, I, if I'm not going to put it in my body, I don't want to put it on the menu. Feel you. Right? But we had so many people come in every day asking for Diet Coke. It was insane. Los Angeles might have a Diet Coke problem. Yeah. To the point where it's like after a year of hearing it. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> He's drinking one right now, dude. Uh, he, uh, ben just took a sip of a Diet Coke. Uh, uh, but they are delicious. I usually drink soda, like maybe if I'm hungover. Anyways, I was so sick of hearing it. I was like, fuck it. And you can sell them for like three fifty a can. They cost 51 cents. Anyways, I brought in Diet Coke. It's just like one of those things that, you know, you, yeah. ha- you have to do it. Yeah. And there's, I, I totally hear you. I feel you. Um, my line in the sand is I don't sell uh, water in plastic bottles. I love it. Um you come in here and you want still water. It's coming out of our filtration system, uh, triple reverse osmosis yeah. filtered water. But I put it in a glass bottle and I bring it to your table because it just makes me feel gross. Yeah. Honestly, you know, like if they made two liters that weren't in plastic bottles, I'd go for them. Um, but the other, th- the other thing is like, you know, we have our ethics and we have our lines in the sand, but then again, you, there's also sentimentality and there's also the the you know the, the 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 ideal is to like bring people back to childhood yeah 100%. remind them of mom what you know all of those you know it's like you know the scene in ratatouille when the guy takes the bite and then Dude. his whole life what? flashes before his eyes that's like that's that's the dream one right? of the best movies ever yeah so you know for that reason i have grape soda yeah because grape soda was my pizza shop drink. Yeah. When I, you know, when I was a teenager in Pittsburgh, going to Aiello's Pizza every day after high school, grape soda. It was grape soda, a cheesesteak, and two slices. Yeah. That was my every day after school. So my, you know, my, the way that I, the way that I look at drinks is like, I just want to stock shit that I like. Yeah. It's, it's a little, it's a little weird. It's a little quirky, but you know, it's what I like. So that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, well, at the end of the day, like this balance that we're talking about, it's your, 
fucking restaurant. You know what I mean? Like you, th- you people come here to have your food. Yeah. They get to experience this place that you've curated, that you've put these pictures on the wall, that you've created these recipes. And, and that's what it should be about. I mean, it's obviously you're here to serve your community, right? But they're getting a piece of you, whether it's a grape soda or the basic Benny, you know what I mean? Like that's why people are coming in here. Yeah. And so I think sometimes the consumer forgets that like, Hey, you know, Domino's or Little Caesars is down the road and you can get that consistency if you want it. But when you come in here, you're getting gorilla pies and yeah. that's, that's going to be, it's, it's one, it's, it's pizza. Yes. That's all over the city, but this is something that stands alone on its own rock for the end all be all of time. Absolutely. And, uh, so if you're listening out there, consumers, it's a one of a kind experience. Any place you go, five stars only. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I see you don't take cash. Yes. Currently. Is, is that, is that ever a problem for you? You know, Do people get mad or pissed once, off. I don't, I don't, I don't accept cash either. I just once, don't deal once, with it. once in a while you get, you get somebody that, that, gets frustrated for no reason um i have i kind of have like a a granny policy like if there's an old you know an old lady or an old man that comes in and they legitimately don't have a card yeah and they just want a slice of pizza i'll take their money and put it on my card i'm not trying to i'm not trying to keep any way anybody away yeah no from from getting food but, you know, it was a series of three events that happened in rapid succession that led me away from cash. A, I got paid with a counterfeit hundred. Yep. B, I got broken into. Uh uh-huh, there it is. And they stole $30 a quarter and it cost me $500 in glass you to, to fix. your door. And then I had to shut down for an entire week because my entire staff got sick at the same time. So, you know, you know, the 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 worries of the worries about just general cleanliness just things things being passed still with you know at the time we're still you know the covid stuff is kind of gone still around everybody's still worried about that and you know and you know shutting down for an entire week is i can't overstate how big of a loss that is and how how much time it takes to recover from one week of revenue not being there yeah and and what the chaos that creates for your business yeah i mean i think that you touched on a lot of things that people don't understand when they come in and and you're a small business not accepting cash you you're paying for credit card fees you yeah. know what i mean like an ass load people don't understand that either every time we take your your card you're paying close to three three percent of the transaction and so it's kind of a pain in the ass for a small business owner but when you're when you don't have to count you don't have to cash out a drawer right you don't have to have a safe there's no bank runs you know you're maybe hopefully you're not getting broken into because there's no cash you know yeah so i don't know we we've run into problems where people have called us classless and told us that you know we're 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 trying to not serve people in the community, but the same way, it sounds like if somebody wants a slice of pizza, they only have cash here. You're going to take care of them. Yeah. I, I, I figure, I figure out a way. Yeah. Um, but it's also like, it's, it's not, it's not, it's never meant to exclude anybody. hundred percent. It's just like, you know, it's a factor of just business. It's a business decision. Yeah. Yeah. I've had like so many conversation or so many questions for you, but I feel like this conversation has been so fluid sure. that we might have already touched on a lot of this stuff. But uh, you you would kind of had touched on um, uh, like write ups or some like media that you mm-hmm. had gotten. Mm-hmm. Was this something that you hired out, or did you um, did you reach out to these people to come in, or like how how have you gained like? that notoriety around Los Angeles? Because you have some great articles that have been written about you guys. Absolutely. Um, the majority of it is completely organic. Um, not the majority of it. All of it is completely organic. Yeah. Um, early on, um, Farley Elliott just dropped in. Um, I guess that he had heard from uh, his, his buddy, uh, unemployed eater 
Um, I had had, I think, heard and tasted, and there were some, uh, Farley has connections to Pennsylvania and by extension Pittsburgh, so he was interested in what I was doing. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't go beyond that. Yeah. Um, our, our branding, visibility, social media, um, I got to give all the credit in the world to my brother, um, JCO, um, cause he's, he's out there. He's been in, he's been in the public eye as a producer, DJ, you know, public figure for some time. And he's, he's, he's out there and he's our public face and he's the one talking about us to all kinds of people, not within the industry. That's kind of social media and that, that side of things. When it comes to the kind of the, the food media, it's 100% people find out about us and they come in. I have not spent a dollar on, on PR. I don't have a PR person. Um, as I said, we just try to show up, do good work, present ourselves authentically and, uh, people gravitate towards it. Yeah. You did your, so you did your brother do the branding? No, uh, branding was done by my homie Archer, um, who is the, uh, the main designer at uh, marathon, which is uh, Nipsey hustles, uh, you know, rest in peace, his, the cultivation company. Okay. Um, and yeah, no, Archer's Archer's a homie of mine from, way back uh, in, from my magazine days, um, when we, <clears throat> as a magazine, we did an artist-based t-shirt line. We were uh, uh, an art magazine that started as graffiti, kind of morphed into graphic design, public art, things like that. And we started a, a t-shirt line and I met Archer in a silkscreen factory and we hit it off and we've been homies ever since. And when it came to doing the branding, um, he was, he was the only dude that I called and the, the logo and the branding pretty much came together. It was probably like an hour, 90 minutes for, for that. Is it a to nod be to Ben, the Ben Davis? It is a nod. Yeah. It's an, it's a nod and it's also a wink because my name is also Ben. Yeah. We are Gorilla Pies. Yeah. I, I grew up here in LA. Yeah. Um, so it was all of that, you know, it's kind of the logo is, is me and the, you know, it's kind of a, uh, co it's a combination of a lot of different things. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. dope. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, Appreciate yeah. it. Um, and who did, did you have a, a, you have a fantastic website, which is a lot of pizza owners. I'm not naming names, but you know who you are. Don't have that, that great of a website. Some people don't even think that you need one. Um, did you build that out or did you have your friends build that out? Like um, that, I, that website is great. Um, the website was done by a company uh, called Digital Onda. They're actually out of Portugal. Um, uh, Shout out Portugal. Yeah. Jordan Howard, uh, one of my best friends from college. It's his, it's his company. And he, you know, when you're starting out doing your own thing, you got to tap your homies. You call on and, all the homies. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Jordan spends most of his time building websites for thought leaders and speakers and like, you know, those, you know, very high end professional people that, you know, are doing TED Talks and shit like that. He doesn't he doesn't really operate in the food space much, but he is he's an absolute foodie, loves restaurants, loves food, culture, music. And it's just, you know, he knows me um, and I know him and our collective or respective styles kind of were kind of came out of the same embryo of the same college. And I just know him and we speak the same language visually. And I know that he is just extremely meticulous yeah so that's what i did via your website you use king arthur and caputo yep uh what caputo bag do you use uh double o the double pizzeria pizzeria, pizzeria blue is it the blue, blue yeah. bag yeah so what did it take you a long time to find the combination and then also before i forget you're using you're using a pre-ferment so are you using is it a sourdough are you mm -hmm. using a sourdough starter yep and a little bit of yeast yep okay so Obviously, you've had some time in your apartment. You've been making pizza for a long time. 
if you can sum up that journey of like how how you got to those two flowers and deciding to do sourdough and using yeast. So it's, I, I spent a long time just uh, trying, trying and having some limited success of making sourdough bread. Um, and that's kind of where my, my interest and my knowledge of starter started. Um, the, the decision on the flowers came through i definitely did a lot of experimentation in early days with you know some of the you know more kind of boutique flowers and you know higher end stuff but at the end of the day when i was setting out to kind of to master my craft i decided i wanted to make excellent pizza period i decided that i the flowers that i wanted to use I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna put anything other than uh, a white flour in my pizza to start, because I've experimented with rye and you know whole grain and a lot of different things, and I th think that you can definitely make a good pizza dough that way. Yeah. But I'm trying to recreate great, amazing pizza. Yeah. So the from a conceptual standpoint. Lancelot represents America yeah, and brother. strong, strong USA. gluten and and New York. Fuck Neapolitan yeah. represents old world Italy tenderness, f you know, fine texture of crumb. So I, I honestly get the hard and the soft. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of, I like to take things from every every angle, just like you know having my heart broken by sourdough as many times as I had, yeah. I decided that I was going to utilize sourdough for flavor, character, and texture, but not necessarily rely on it for leavening. Mm -hmm. So after some... Smart man. <laughs> after, after some pain and, and having, you know, losing a couple dough batches... Um, I came to the fact that my pre-ferment, I don't, I use it when typically people think that it's spent. I want it to be not dead, but I want it to have gone through its entire process and almost be flat. Yeah. Because when you're, when you do go in with an active sourdough culture that hasn't gone through its rise and fall, that happens in your proofing box. Yeah. And man, the, the, the times that, that we misplayed that or used starter that was a little too young and you open it up and all of your beautiful balls are just one it's a gamble, mess of just like unusable dough. Um, that's it's, I'm still scarred by it. Sourdough will break your heart. I liked that. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely it, it will. will. So, um, I just made a strategic decision early on that I was going to use both because that, that, that instant yeast is going to stay alive. It's not going to, it's not going to go crazy and then go away. Um, you know, like sourdough is like capturing lightning in a bottle. Um, and when I was going to start a retail business and I wanted to have consistency to me, those things were, diametrically opposed. Like if you want consistency doing it with sourdough is probably, it just felt too risky. Yeah. Honestly. So I decided to give myself a little bit of insurance with the instant yeast. Yeah. Very, very minimal. I don't, you know, yeah, yeah. I don't, don't use that much. much at all. Um, and then a very long proof. So you're doing 24 hour for men or is it longer than that? I, I don't like to, I don't like to use it before 72. Okay. Um, and I, I've pushed it out to, I've made, I've made pizza from dough that's been fermenting for two weeks. Holy shit. Okay. Yeah. So very minimal amount of yeast. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. I like pushing the boundaries. I wouldn't do it all the time. Push it to the limit. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah. When you're pumping pizzas out, it's probably hard and then you got space issues, but yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a failure in your career that you can share that, uh, taught you something or really helped you grow? <sighs> Plenty. Um, all right, let's hear them all. <laughs> yeah, just pick one. Um, I would say the, 
the I spent I spent a number of years uh, trying to launch a sauce and marinade company and get that off of the ground. Um, and the most valuable lesson that I learned there was you can't skip any steps. Um, my approach my approach to that company was really trying to leapfrog the farmer's market ground level approach of building up a customer base and building a brand customer by customer. Um, and after doing that, after doing it for a couple of years and really trying to get traction, um, the biggest, the biggest lesson that I learned was like, you, you just, you cannot skip any steps. So when I started over doing pizza, so I was going to start small, start local, build relationships with customers one by one and let it grow. Don't put any pressure on it to be any certain size at any certain amount of time. It needed to grow organically for stability. So, you know, I did the pop-up until that was, you know, until I outgrew that space. And then when I opened up here, you know, I've tried to keep it relatively conservative. You know, I'm only open five days a week. Um, because, you know, there's no guarantee, there's no guarantees. I just trying to be as cautious as I can to only go as far as my customer base is willing to support. Yeah. Which is hard. I mean, your patience is we hear, I hear this all the time, but it's like one of the hardest things because as a business owner, you're looking at your banking account, you're looking at payroll, you're looking at all, yeah. all kinds of things. And it's like, you can only hold on for so long, but you got to trust in the process. Absolutely. Gotta, and I guess that's just trusting yourself, which is, we kind of touched on how scary that can be when you're your own boss and yeah. holding yourself accountable. Yeah. Well, I mean, look no further than the countless examples of people that have been the flash on the pan that do something that's great, expand at a breakneck pace and then just collapse. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't support it. Yeah. I, that's not, I have no interest in growing so fast that I collapse. Do you want more than one of these? Yes. Okay. What What would be the number? I don't, I don't know. You don't have that number? No idea. So maybe 10? Sure. Okay. The sky's the limit, as they yeah, say. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, well, we had such a fluid conversation that I'm, I, I think most of this got answered, but I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with one of the most important questions of this interview that boils down to this question, what is the greatest band or artist of all time and why? Oh man. You know, I heard, I heard you ask Tommy this the other day and I was like, God damn, I need an answer for this. I'm going to go beastie boys. Oh, I love it. I love it. Great you know, answer. How, you know, longevity, you know, trend transcending genres. Um, just absolute tastemakers, you know, created culture outside of their music, just represented so many amazing things and so many kind of like things that, you know, like, you know, being a B-boy, you know, also like Jews and hip hop. I'm a Jew. I love hip hop. Like, punk rock too, yeah. you know, they and punk, you know, just just being balls out and being creative and having fun and, you know, being silly and, you know, dressing up in costumes and just being just painfully creative. That's, it's been an inspiration to me, you know, it's probably, you know, heard, you know, Paul's boutique when I was like 10. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever forget the first time I heard the girls. Yeah. Being a kid. That beat. <laughs> ding, 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 did you ever see them live? Yes. Yeah. They, that was like one of, that's like one of the, I saw them at Sasquatch on the Gorge in Washington. It was like one of the best shows I've ever seen. Yeah. I saw them at, I want to say is Cal State Dominguez Hills when I was a sophomore in college, I think. So that was like early, early 2000s. Or like late '90s, early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, they were banging, didn't you? Man. Pittsburgh. Did you ever? I gotta ask this question. Have you ever? Uh, I know a guy, one of my favorite people in pizza. His name's Rico. He's the the owner of Slice on Broadway. Okay. Have you ever been out there? Have you ever had that restaurant? I haven't. 
He's but, the whole reason I know what a Yinzer is. <laughs> I just want to shout out Rico, dude, and, and Pittsburgh Pizza, dude. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm so far overdue to kind of make a pilgrimage and go back and look at Pittsburgh Pizza with fresh eyes. Yeah. Um, since most of what I do is just living in my memory of, of youth. Yeah. But uh, I'm absolutely looking looking for an excuse and an opportunity to get back there, make some pizza, eat some pizza, kind of do do the whole tour. So. Well, it's nice that you have, you're you're born in Los Angeles. You lived in Pittsburgh. You came back here. You got a pizzeria. You know, you're calling it Pittsburgh style pizza, but I think like I talked to Chadwick, the owner of Two Dos, and he just really sold the best version of what I think like LA pizza is, and that's the pizza that you're that you make, you know, yourself. Right. And you know, I think you're doing something special out here Thank for, you so much. for the city. And I'm excited to hopefully stay in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. And man. and and be a, a be a pizza pal. Absolutely. I really appreciate you doing this. Well, uh, thanks for having and me. Opening up your space and and giving me your time because I know I know we don't have a lot of time. Absolutely, and and I I appreciate the conversation to be real because nobody else understands like somebody else that owns, that has that has a shop. Yeah. Well, it's, it's just, literally like having a gorilla on your back all the time. <laughs> Who are you telling? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, last question. Where do we go to get in contact with you if somebody wants to pick your brain or order food? or? Yeah. Um, number at the shop is 818-821-3777. I am chef underscore osh, O-S-H on Instagram. At Gorilla Pies is the, is the shop. Um, ben at GorillaPies.com. Pull up Valley Village Gorilla Pies. You're going to love it. Thank you so much. You're not going to miss Ben. He's 10 feet tall now. He grew a whole foot during this interview. You're not going to miss him. Anyways, dude, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you, brother. I don't want to know.